Welcome to Show Studio's live panel discussions. In these discussions, experts from all parts of the industry discuss and debate the most important Fashion Week shows of the season. Today, in the midst of Couture, we're going to be discussing the Jean-Paul Gaultier Couture uh, oh, Spring 2022 collection, guest designed by Glenn Martins. But first, let's watch this short video for some context that was recorded pre-show. Meet Glenn Martins and Jean-Paul Gaultier. This week, the Belgian designer will present a couture collection for the House of Gaultier Paris. The French brand was launched by Jean-Paul Gaultier in 1976, and both the man and the brand have gone down in fashion history, known for iconic design staples including hyper-androgynous silhouettes, sailor stripes, corsets, punkish tartan and tattoos, and of course those Madonna cone bras. But now he's giving another generation of designers complete creative freedom at his brand. First came Sakai's Chitose Abe, and next up it's Glenn. After graduating from fashion school in Antwerp, Glenn worked for the Gaultier Squared line. However, since then, he's come to achieve critical acclaim in his own right, as the creative director for Diesel, and more predominantly for Y Project. Like Gaultier, Glenn's references often look to the street, and unveiling a Gaultier partnership for Y Project Autumn Winter 22, he played on the Gaultier Cyber Barbar collection from the 1990s. However, he's teased that for Gaultier Paris Couture, it will be all about dresses inspired by the Y Project archives, bringing his penchant for twisted and subverted silhouettes, neo-historical references and Belgian design mindset of deconstruction into the intricate art of couture. His anti-establishment, joyful attitude is expected to marry well with the legacy of Gaultier, fashion's enfant terrible. A new chapter begins. Here we go, exciting. Um, my name is Benji Park and it appears I'll never be able to do a show studio introduction without tripping over my words, but I go by the pseudonym Fashion Boy on TikTok um, and I am best known as a fashion commentator and analyst um, and I am joined by our lovely panel who we're going to start with. Osama, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, hello. Um, my name is Osama. I'm based in Dubai. Um, I'm a stylist, uh, fashion commentator. I do a lot of reviews on Instagram. And um, yeah, I'm here with you guys today. Um, and then Ryan. Hi, everyone. I'm Ryan. I'm also a fashion commentator. I'm a writer and a video producer here in New York. And I'm usually that adult on the internet. And TJ. Hey, I am TJ, junior editor at The Face, um, mainly work on fashion features. And Tuba? Uh, I'm a marketeer and I do fashion reviews and give stylistic devices on YouTube. Fun. Okay, so we've got a full house of like fashion journalists, fashion academics. Um, so for the next hour, I'm going to pick all of your brains about the Jean-Paul Gaultier Spring 2022 Couture Collection, which was pretty gorgy in my opinion. Um, so I just want like initial thoughts firstly before we really like delve into context. Um, TJ, uh, yeah, I'm going to say TJ. TJ, do you want to start? Because The Face is a magazine that obviously is so involved in like culture. And I feel like Glenn Martins is someone with like Diesel coming up and everything who, who's very much in, involved with youth culture. What did you think of the show? Yeah, a hundred percent. I think Glenn, I mean, I, I've always been a huge fan of Glenn, you know, what, what he's done at Y Project more recently with Diesel. Um, he completely subverted, um, he completely subverted the brand, you know, the, the, the whole brand, Diesel essentially made it really sexy again. Um, mm -hmm. So obviously, yeah, it was really exciting, you know, you know uh, that, that when it was announced that he'd be the second uh, guest collaborator at JPG. Um, I mean, I think firstly, my thoughts is that I, I am a, I'm a huge fan of the whole guest designer thing. Um, it feels really contemporary to me. Um, it, you know, breathes new, new life into a design house without sort of having to make any kind of drastic changes. Mm. Uh, you know, we're all a bit like collaboration mad at the moment. It, you mm. know, it's become this huge buzzword. Um, but recently, you know, we've seen various fashion houses partner up, Bendy and Versace, Gucci and Balenciaga. Um, so for me, like guest designers, it, it feels like a natural progression in how houses will be approaching uh, keeping their collections interesting season by season. And Glenn saw, you know, I think him and Jay, him and Jean-Paul Gaultier, I think that it, it's a it's a really nice it's a really nice collaboration that fits fits really well. Mm. Uh, they're, they're both radical thinkers, I think, in my opinion. 
No, yeah, I agree with that. And Tuba, obviously, sort of your main medium is is YouTube. What were your initial thoughts of that? Because it's a collection that visually, I feel like for my audience, is so accessible um, because it was just so beautiful. You didn't, it was one of those collections where the more context you know, the better, the more you understand it. But it was just so gorgeous as a standalone. For video mediums, it's like almost like a critic's dream. What, what, what did you think about the collection? I think um, I actually wasn't that surprised. I think uh, when we think of Glad Martins, he's an outrageous like illusion artist. He's a very visionary mastermind, and there uh, we are very much used to his nods to surrealism. Um, he gets strongly influenced by our perceptions. We see that in his uh, common uh, white project collections also. And here again, we saw these nods to me and. Um, I think we also see like his inspiration from Esha, from surrealist painters that he has uh, playing with 3D. Uh, and there's always something very surprising, always something un unexpected. And what I liked here the most, it uh, was not in a conventional, a classical haute couture show to me. It more seemed like um, he wasn't working with the traditional silhouettes of couture. He wasn't working with the cl a classical embellishments. Uh, the classical um, bedding and stuff that we're used to. He was still using it uh, in terms of cuts. And mm -hmm. he managed to kind of use innovative design features and uh, to create this flow of this ethereal ways of flowing with the fabrics that it still seemed like it's couture. But uh, design-wise, I think it was very different. And that was what made it so successful, in my opinion. Yeah, I agree. I think it's fascinating how he still obviously had to conform to the really strict parameters of the Chambre Syndicale de la Couture, but still presented a collection that felt like it fitted into both Jean-Paul Gaultier and his own DNA. It didn't feel overdone or, or sort of overproduced, despite some critics saying that they felt that, but personally, I didn't feel it. And um, I would be really fascinated to talk to the Couture clients of like Chanel and Dior and see how they feel that is sort of representative of couture and it developing in that collection um because there's only between a thousand couture clients in the world and then up to four thousand who have purchased couture at some point in their life so it's quite a fascinating kind of diversion um ryan what were you what, what were you what were you thinking what were your thoughts i thought the collection was really really good i was happy to see a showing that showed discernment but still was able to execute as far as uh, like very detailed couture elements of design. I was expecting maybe a little bit over to be very overwhelmed by this couture show just based on like some of the few previous shows that I've seen, mm. but it wasn't overwhelming. The discernment that he showed, I think is reflective of his ethos with his brand at Y Project and what he's done at Diesel. I think that he shows a level of discernment that is necessary and feels really contemporary and forward. And I think it pushes the rest of the fashion industry to reflect that as well. Yeah, I would agree. I think his his work at these his work at Y Project originally and now at Diesel, it feels like he really has this like linear string of self identity that he then ties into simultaneously the brand's history, but also the consumer base and what they want, uh, sort of different demographics. And he seems to have a real talent to do that without the clothes coming off too sort of like out of left field. Um, Osama, obviously, you, you work for Farfetch as well. Um, from a consumer perspective, thinking about this, is this a sort of collection that one expects looking at what Jean-Paul Gaultier, well, obviously it's had a massive revival in terms of people selling uh, like pre-loved and vintage Jean-Paul Gaultier stuff, but also Y Project. Do you feel like that did marry both brands looking at their products? I honestly feel like we're in such an era where like collaboration is so around us, it's so present within the like fashion landscape and it felt like, it was very accessible. Something about it felt very accessible because it's so straightforward. Um, it's very straightforward, but at the same time, the technicality of it reminds you that it's an haute couture collection. So mm -hmm. I felt like there was something about it that was like diluted very well for you to be able to consume it, even if you're not necessarily like an haute, an haute couture client or uh, like um, a fashion mogul, like you did not need to. I mean, obviously, as you said, if you have more information about the collaboration, you're more likely to, to be able to absorb it. But I felt like it was quite an easy collection to absorb and I feel like um, of course the most probably is very different a, di a very different target than the Jor and the Chanel Haute Couture client for sure but I feel like there's an accessibility behind it that might be 
you know, speaking to eventually they're ready to wear JPG clients in, in, in a way, but it's a very, um, it's kind of a very ready to wear couture as, as much as it's very theatrical mm -hmm. somehow. Um, yeah, honestly, I thought it was a grandiose collection. Very great, very, very surprised. Yeah, I agree. I think that the images that we've seen like sort of broadcasted that have gone viral are some of the massive pieces. Like he did like a 15 meter train for one of them. But some of the pieces when you do go through the whole collection, there are more accessible pieces that not only talk to perhaps the conventional haute couture client, but also speak to people who don't necessarily sort of understand or, or want to understand haute couture. There are pieces that are just beautiful for silhouette. Um, and I think that's a real talent to have, to be able to feed into like the fashion industry's ferocious desire for performance, but also to have someone who just comes across it on their phone, to have them enjoy it. Um, talking sort of about that, about drama and performance and how we've been so deprived of it during COVID and how keen we are for it now, and also how crap the Dior and Chanel Haute Couture shows were. I, I can't speak for anyone else, but for me, a horse doesn't make a collection. Um, was this the performance that we needed? Obviously, Scar Scaparelli was gorgeous, and I, I did a show studio panel on that, so go and watch it if you want to know. Um, um, but is this bringing a bit of performance back to fashion? Is this bringing a bit of young blood, new blood? Glenn's not that young, no offense, Glenn. Um, but like new blood to the sort of very antiquated couture part of the world. Um, Brian, I'd love to know your thoughts on that. Yeah, I definitely think that it is. I think it has a really great element of performance and also a really good balance of not playing too hard on performative fantasy ideas, but also not playing too hard on uh, distancing ourselves from like what couture really is. I just really appreciate that it, I don't know, I think it, it toes a really good balance of performance and youth. And like I said, like emphasizing what's happening in the contemporary and then bringing it to the couture stage without being so like old lady and grandma and like distanced mm -hmm. from what people actually want and are saying and like speaking. I think it references a lot of the street culture of Y project and of Gautier's like entire history, which I feel like some of his earlier couture sh shows, especially in like the early 2000s, still brought the like street element and like weird performance element of like what was happening in ready to wear. I feel like it does that really well while keeping the balance of really elegant, refined garments. And Tuba, was this one of your top shows of the season? Again, like I've said, you are, you are sort of like video um, medium yeah. like I am, do you feel like this was really a show that, that did bring that element of performance that I think is so much at the forefront of the fashion psyche at the moment with the recent passing of Manfred, of Manfred Thierry Mugler, but also Virgil Abloh, who was all about culture as opposed to just let's put something down the runway and other fashion personalities and incredible sort of like dramatists like Andre Leon Talley. Do you think the internet is keen for this performance? Well, um, I have to say I'm actually pretty biased when it comes to to the margins, but I think um, this is really ha this has definitely been the couture show. I think I don't think there will come anything uh, better. Uh, but um, I think what you managed like so greatly is using I mean denim on a couture show. Um, I mean, except for the uh, we we have seen some at uh, some Chanel shows, but. I don't think that we can compare this at all, but using the technique and the heritage of Jean-Paul Gaultier, uh, who was also inspired by street, by strong femininity, and usually all couture as it is something very classical, something uh, very traditional. You have these huge gowns, but making, being able to create gowns and making them modern. And we see, we see them also at Valentino and Pia Paolo is also doing it pretty well, but I think Glenn is definitely the most revolutionary one out there was using the same fabrics, but different silhouettes. He managed to, um, he was also using embellishments. I got, also got some strong Alexander McQueen vibes when we saw these big embellishments, but it was not this classical embellishment where we want to see that people have been working like a thousand hours on sequence. It's been something different, very artistic. And I think that's something very new for the two. It's not about this classical image of beauty, uh, mm -hmm. but it's something very disruptive. And that's definitely been missing in old culture, in my opinion. So I think he's definitely the best out there when it right now comes to culture. And uh, also when it comes to his own ready to wear, he's, he likes to be disruptive and to wrench and intertwined materials and everything. So um, yeah, I think it's great to see this collaboration and I think it's one of a kind. Yeah, and I agree. I mean, it's time for Couture to sort of like loosen up a bit. We're not in the era of Charles Frederick Worth anymore. Like. Yeah. 
it's not fun to have that like 18th century chic look like it's boring um and for so long designers like guo pei and sort of designers specifically um in asia have been completely disenfranchised because the chambre syndicale de la couture just won't let them in basically uh for years and years and years and that that feeds into fashion's western exclusivity as much as it does feed into just haute couture stuffiness um tj i just want to touch on something that you mentioned earlier which is this this idea of how you thought it was sort of the best development of collaboration how we're so bored like if kim jones does another collaboration i like oh my god i will i will sacrifice my first child like it is so boring do you think this felt i saw one um vogue journalist say it felt more like a conversation than a collaboration is that just like bollocks buzzwords or do you think there's actually some substance to this i mean i yeah i'm not a fan of uh, the collaborative buzzword I think it's really annoying it's really tiresome everyone's using it um but I do like I mean I, I don't know what editor or what uh, what journalist said that but I like that you know that it is it felt more like a conversation and it, it was more like a ping pong match as, as as opposed to you know this whole kind of grand collaborative affair that people love to sort of drone on about these days um but I think in this collection there was a really clear synergy in how Martin's approached the collection um and I think that, you know, that comes down to Martin's, his, his strength, you know, it lies in innovation. He's like a, a true forward facing designer. Um, he never, you know, in his past collections for Y Project, et cetera, he never really indulges himself in nostalgia. Um, and for me anyway, that's the mark of an interesting designer. You know, you're creating something new, you're looking forward, you're not, you know, just kind of reappropriate in the past. Um, so I think he was a really, really good fit uh for a couture collection because as the others just just mentioned you know couture is it's 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 a really tired and boring institution you know i mean it's amazing to look at scaparelli for example was incredible but as a whole you know the whole not you know not letting certain designers in and all that kind of stuff it's not it, you know how much does it really resonate with a gen z audience mm -hmm. um so, you know, I, I think that's kind of, sorry, did, did any of that make sense? <laughs> no, no, it did, it did, it did. I'm vibing, I'm just, I'm thinking at the same time, but no, it was brilliant. Um, and I, I do understand what you mean in terms of, he just, he, he did, he had a brilliant, he had a brilliant synergy and it feels like he was adding to a conversation that other people will want to participate in. Fashion dialogues are so, so um exclusive and so like oh you need to be in the know like if you if you don't know about all of these parameters of Okature, like don't talk about it but the truth is like the whole point is that the next generation cares enough to continue so it's important that people feel new blood that and that they, they look at stuff and think that it's beautiful because if you enjoy it in some capacity if it's provocative in some capacity you'll be interested enough to learn about it and to keep on that fashion ecosystem um osama do you think that Glenn achieved that to the full extent? I mean, it was a big collection. There was some criticism that the coral piece, which is like, look, 14, I saw some people say it was a bit overwhelming, that they felt like it kind of overpowered the piece and that it felt like it was sort of drama for the sake of drama. Personally, I thought it was gorgeous. I loved it. Um, but do you feel like it, it, was, it was a marriage rather than an overpowering? I don't think it was drama for the sake of drama. One thing that... Um, honestly strikes me a lot about this collaboration and that it's, it felt really balanced. And I think the important things with all of these, you know, like having a guest designer in a house is also, we have to remember that there's a smaller house and a bigger house. And I think what was great here is that I truly feel like Glenn had a platform um, and really truly got to use the tools and the, you know, technicality and savoir-faire of Jean-Paul Gaultier, which allowed him to express his vision, his thoughts. Like it was fun. There's a lot of things that I looked at and I was like, oh my God, that's really like, I, like I enjoyed the drama of it and I didn't feel like it was just clickbait. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, because of the climate that we're in and obviously losing a lot of big fashion figures lately, I felt like it was done with a lot of sobriety, which felt really in phase with the current climate and how things were kind of going at the moment. So I think honestly it was, to me at least perfectly dosed and and creatively very balanced it seemed very credible to me yeah i agree i mean we had looks like look 30 which will magically appear on the computer hopefully um which was very sort of not um sobering but the silhouette of it was very 
sort of simple compared to the rest of the collection. It was beautiful. It was just gorgeous and really well done. And I do feel like that feeds into sort of what we want Couture to be. But then we had looks towards the end of the collection, the last look with like incredible billowing train that just felt like more of an exploration. Um, Tuba touched on how he used denim um, and Chitose Abe obviously used denim in her last collection where she was sort of moonlighting as designer. And it, it was so well done. And for so long, people have been really stuffy about denim. I, I mean, I remember when Celine released denim jeans when Eddie Sliman first started that were really like interesting really beautifully well done um and every like mum with a Range Rover ran out and bought a pair because they were just gorgeous um and that was kind of like ruffled feathers a bit but now seeing it in couture and it looked really organic and really well done um I do just want to touch on the fact that we've spoken how brilliant Glenn is is as a designer and I agree that I, I do think he's great but um designer residences we've had glenn martins and chitose abbe they're really established designers who quite frankly are already quite wealthy and very successful is it time to inject some new blood into the house to use the house as a chance to give designers who have been literally flawed by covid because so many of the fashion organizations have failed them because we just don't have enough well we don't have enough money allegedly um despite the fact that we're a multi-billion dollar industry but that's another conversation um and now you know struggling coming out of covid and glenn is already at diesel and successful at y project would have this a chance to give someone like Charles Jeffrey, who's an incredible designer with such drama and such drive and such love for culture and uh, sort of nurturing the next generation. Um, Ryan, what do you think about that? Could there have been a designer next time, because this was a gorgeous collection and Glenn deserves that accolade, that is that we're actually sort of giving a spotlight to who deserves it? Yeah, I, I certainly think that there's a lot of young designers who have the ability and capacity to translate their ideas through a larger fashion house who could have been given the opportunity. And I think that it's something that the fashion industry could lean toward, especially like even just thinking about profitability and being like not the nicest person ever. I think that it would be really profitable and like in, intentional when creating like a couture show that informs whatever happens in ready to wear if the brands have the power to do so to take advantage of younger and like more creative talent that isn't already established. And I don't really know why they don't take advantage of it, especially with how like exhausting the fashion industry is and the banality of everything that we've seen in the last few years, especially during and like, I don't wanna say post COVID, but since COVID has started, it's been so boring. And I feel like it would breathe a lot, breathe a lot of new life into the industry, but I don't really think that maybe, maybe it could be an investor issue that people aren't willing to take advantage of people who are less established because of yeah more restrictive there but I think it would be amazing I think it'd be a really good idea yeah I think I mean I suppose the real tea is fashion has the cash it just moves in the same circles and that's why it's you know so difficult for young designers to break in Tuba I mean how, how do you feel about that do you think there is a, a designer who next time could be given exposure I mean for me Charles Jeffrey comes to mind straight away but uh, because he's a British designer and I love him um but you know there are so many incredible designers recently I was looking at a bunch of designers coming out of Vietnam who just have the most incredible understanding of like taffeta for some reason um is, is there a designer in mind who you think could do it well next time I think um first of all I think we're already on a pretty good path when it comes to taking Glenn Martins. I mean, okay, even though he's the creative director at Diesel now, I think uh, it really took a long time uh, since we could even uh, get designers like Glenn Martins to get uh, just a bit more of the spotlight. Uh, but I, I, for example, would also love to see some Korean or Asian designers such as Shushu Tong, for example, who, as you said, are like huge fans of Taffeta and like of the Prada of the 90s somehow that I'm most mesmerized by. So. I would definitely also like to see more international people. I would also love to see someone like Wales Bonner doing these kind of things. I uh, can't imagine that it would be like great to see this French and very 70s British old school influence all together. Um, I, that's something I can also definitely imagine being extremely great uh, at a couture show because she's like very sporty, um, still has a very uh, chic silhouette, usually strongly inspired by different cultures. That's something that's maybe missing a bit when we take Glenn Martins, uh, but that would be like a different perception. So that's also something. These kind of designers, I would also love to see uh, making a collaboration or 
guest presentation. Yeah, I agree. I think so many, also these are designers who've been left out of the conversation, you know, majority of the IPOC designers who've been left out of the conversation because Couture has been this like exclusive club. I was talking to randomly several Orthodox Jews who run this like mill in London, um, who were saying that they have produced things that are sort of couture standard for a long time and, and they sell them to, to clients around the world, but still no one's really interested in working with, with a group of Orthodox Jews uh, in a couture, which I think is fascinating. I mean, Moa Lola, who has an incredible use of leather, would be so good giving her a couture collection. Uh, Priya Alualia, Grace Wales Bonner, these are designers who are retrospective, but not to the point of cliche it's not the same 90s stuff I mean I wasn't even born in the 90s and I feel like I lived in the 90s like I have seen so much 90s stuff it's ridiculous um like you said too but I think you know someone like Grace Wells Bonner with that sort of like 70s vision and also who plays into the um like Afro-Caribbean emergence uh, in London during the time and the rise of Notting Hill and stuff like that would be incredible and we've never seen perspectives like that before in Couture um, so that would be a really really important thing to happen that would feel like it had proper oomph to it as a collection um, we have touched on the fact obviously that Glenn Martins is already has two jobs um, Osama I want to know your thoughts on designers holding multiple sort of residencies and jobs I mean we had Karl Lagerfeld who had Chanel and Fendi and then his eponymous brand Karl Lagerfeld. And now we've got Kim Jones, who, Kim, babes, I think you're stretched a little thin because that Fendi collection was not it, um, who obviously is Fendi and Dior. Do you think that we should be saying, designers, you should really just focus on one house? Like, there are already not enough top jobs in fashion that aren't being given to a diverse group of people. Yeah. I think from a creative standpoint, there's something about it that just doesn't fully add up in my mind because I'm like, if you're in one house already and you're trying to like focus and like there's a lot happening. I mean, you're we're talking about huge corporations with huge teams, huge ateliers, everything, of course. But I, I can see how overwhelming it could be, but you can also feel it in the delivery and of collections. Like um, you can't be as great as both. There's like unless you're taking on projects that are very different with like if it's a menswear project and then a couture project in Kim's case. But even that is very debatable, honestly, I think some in some ways it can be a bit questionable sometimes but um i firmly believe in focus a lot especially when you're taking on a new role and i think sometimes it can be a bit overwhelming for even big designers to take on two houses i mean carl was doing it even like for fendi and chanel at the same time than his own label which was very much a commercial merch line to be honest but uh, i still think it's very questionable um very honestly yeah, because the fashion schedule is just so laborious now. We expect so much from designers. It's like, give us a pre-fall collection, give us a resort collection. like, And then you've got the normal fashion calendar on top of all of these things that we've sort of like added so that people can have mimosas on yachts and stuff like that. Um, which, no shame to that if that's your vibe. Um, TJ, for a magazine like The Face, which is such like, a, not just a fashion magazine, it's such just like a cultural sort of it spreads out through culture. Um, are there any young designers who you feel like could really be given kind of like the lifeblood of the representation that Jean-Paul Gaultier would give? Yeah, totally. I mean, <clears throat> I highly agree with you that Charles Jeffrey would be really good there. I'm, I'm a huge fan of Charles, I think he's great. Um, and also, you know, fashion at the moment, it's at, a really, it's at a really interesting point politically, I think, because we're all searching for this kind of deeper meaning and everything because of, you know, the pandemic and whatnot, but as well, it's, it's, it's a chance for designers to get really like optimistic about the future. And I, I think that's quite nice. We, you know, we didn't really see a lot of sort of like depressing collections this season. It all seemed to, it, it all seemed to face into this like sort of utopian, utopian future that we're all hoping for. Uh, where we, you know, I don't know whether it's rave, whether it's, you know, referencing nature or whatever, any of that kind of stuff. Um, so I think at the moment, emerging designers are doing a great job at sort of injecting a bit of fun back into fashion, making things sort of sexy and exciting again. Um, and I think we saw that, we saw that really, really clearly at, at the London shows in September. Yeah. Yeah, with someone like SS Daily, for example, that was brilliant. Yeah, I mean, I, I was, I was honestly, I was, I was so excited, like you know, kind of coming out of London Fashion Week out the other end because, 
mean, London's always been best at, you know, supporting the emerging designers and all those, you know, slightly younger, radical, subversive, underground thinkers. Um, and, you know, last September, it, it, it was such a, it was such a great time. I mean, one, because we were all going back to, you know, physical shows and presentations, which I think a lot of us really missed, but also because um, it felt, yeah, it felt really, really optimistic. And I think with something like Couture, it does need that like new lease of life, mm -hmm. um, just to kind of make it fun, make it exciting, make it, you know, kind of spice things up a bit. So yeah, someone like Charles Jeffrey, uh, Moa Lola, I mean, I'm a huge fan, I think Moa Mo is incredible. Um, also like Paulina Russo, I think would be really good. I love, mm -hmm. I, I really, really love pa Paulina and her techniques are great as well. I mean sort of knitwear techniques that she uses. Very inventive. Yeah, I, I don't know. I would love to see a couture collection where they gave each like a different person a look. Like each designer was like, we could see like one collection where it was like literally like 65 different young designers. I think that would just be incredible. And they would have the audience of couture clients to spend that money and to give them a massive cash injection. But I know that that's like yeah. not going to happen. So scared of sort of making these, uh, of just shaking things up essentially you know I think like the guest collaboration thing while it is great but it's not like it's quite wild that it's taken this long for it to happen at a couture house do you know what I mean and especially when it's already with uh such an established designer like Glenn um I, I think Glenn was a great choice as a guest collaborator you know I previously said that I'm a huge fan mm -hmm. uh, but the fact it has taken this long just to kind of you know get the whole like guest collaborator thing going kind of speaks volumes like I just, just, yeah, these brands are like just so scared of like making any sort of. Yeah, everyone's scared of, of sort of like worrying their demographic, worrying their consumer. Yeah. In reality, consumers are so bored. Stuff is so samey. Oh my God, I walk through a department store and I just want to eat. I don't even want to look at the clothes, but that might be more of a reflection on me. Um, Tuba, do you see this like residency thing having longevity? Is this a structure that we, or that not that just we as a fashion ecosystem could substantiate, but also that you would want to see? Um, do you want to see more fashion residencies at big houses? I said, yeah, I was just wondering if I cut out. Yeah, you know, uh, fashion residencies uh, in big houses. Um, I think, yeah, that's um, something I can actually imagine, like um, when it comes to uh, houses that have, I mean, if we're talking about the collaboration things, I definitely see that we need to push you further, the younger designers and implement this and um, just creating one huge house and just this one big name and uh, just a big designer name behind it is not bringing us any further. And it's definitely not that what the audience and the target groups, which obviously are the youngest among us right now, are not interested in. I mean, if you just look at TikTok trends, if you look at what is actually emerging, on the social market, it's definitely not this classical or couture or this classical image. So we definitely see, I mean, we just shouldn't give the audience what they ask for because that can also be kind of trash. Mm -hmm. uh, but we definitely need to get a bit younger, a bit more, um, yeah, more inspired and um, yeah, implement this a bit more also in the big houses. So that's definitely something um, that needs to change in my opinion. Mm. And Ryan, do you feel like this was a collection that spoke to the Gen Z couture consumer. Obviously, the majority of us Gen Z aren't, you know, pulling out our pennies to suddenly throw them at Glenn Martin's Jean Picotier. But is this the one of the collections that entices the future rich kids to commit to couture? Well, I think it does. And I think it comes from Glenn Martin's having this weird ability to almost like future predict with his demographic, where he doesn't reflect the youth's like interests as they exist, he like puts it into you, like this is what you wanted. And then when it comes to you, you're like, yeah, thank you, it is. He has a really good skill at that. He's always shown that at Y Project. So I think that it, it fills in a really important lacuna of like desire for the youth where he meets everybody's needs while informing them about like the past and the whole, the culture and the history of Latier and then taking from his own archive. I think it completely fulfills the space of like, enchanting the younger audience to like start participating in couture if they have the access this would be the perfect like entryway everybody was enchanted by it on social media on every platform I've never seen people so universally excited by one collection there was no like dissension everybody agreed that this was like an ex 
extremely enchanting collection, especially in Gen Z. So I think this was like the perfect effort in that direction. Yeah, I agree. I, I, it's just about making sure that people understand, especially in like post COVID austerity, that fashion isn't just a point of sort of frivolity. It's not just a luxury. There are necessities in terms of creative outlet and in many ways, you know, and this is like a personal belief. I think fashion is one of the highest art forms because it's art that you can wear and that participates actively in, in human culture. Um, but that's just my belief, like as an academic. Um, Osama, I just wanted to hear what were, what were your favorite looks? What were your favorite featured looks? Like what were your favorite features of looks? I think that something that Glenn did really nicely was he had like the little Y seam um, on like look five. And it was a really nice nod to like, who he is as a person. Did you have any looks that just like totally stood out to you? Um, I think the, um, the looks where he played around the Cyber Baba print, uh, the famous uh, Jean-Paul Gaultier print with his own cuts were very interesting for me. Uh, Cause I felt like it was very straightforward. Um, something about it felt as well, kind of educational. Like it's just, it's him having a platform, but also, you know, carrying on the legacy and kind of making justice to that platform, which I thought was fun. Um, uh, Every look that had like a lot of fabric, especially there's this like, I think it was one of the last ones, the big puffy uh, dress with a lot, lot of fabric that was off shoulder was I think a moment. The green one was absolutely gorgeous as well. Um, honestly, the, I think his technicality and the way he has this very subtle way of manipulating fabric, which I, th I think is always kind of spectacular to witness, especially now that he's at a house where resources are available. So it's, um, yeah, I honestly, throughout the whole collection, I was wowed. So I, the whole collection is a favorite. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I think the the green piece was gorgeous. It actually reminded me of a young couturier called Andrea Broker, who like sort of made headlines last year for being I the think he's based here, no? couturier in the world. Yeah, I think he's based in Dubai, no? Yeah, yeah, he's-, he's Yeah, he's, yeah, 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 of course, I've seen his work. Sri Lankan, French, yep. yeah, yep. Um, and a lovely bloke as well. Really nice dude, um, but just gorgeous. He 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 really understands how to do that sort of like abscess of fabric in a way that doesn't feel stuffy, but that just felt reminiscent. Um, I do want to hear everyone's favorite looks because I'm just kind of keen to know people's different aesthetics. TJ, did you did you have any looks that really stood out to you? Uh, I, I think uh, I I really like the inclusion of the denim full length skirt. I thought I thought that was cool. Uh, and, you know, we saw it recently with Demna having denim at his first uh, Balenciaga collection and people were so kind of divided about it. But I think it's it's very much it's, it's going to become a normal part of couture. And that's, you know, I think those are just like little ways of like not alienating the Gen Z audience too much. They're obsessed with these kind of images of like, you know, couture and all these you know, incredible untangible dresses I mean, they are tangible but you know they seem so worlds worlds apart for most mm -hmm. people um so yeah 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 I, I, th I thought that was nice. and also that I think felt very Jean-Paul Gaultier without having to do like you know the boob print or body contouring or something it was it yeah was like, it was a nice nod you know to like um to that, that sort of like futurism that JPG was doing in the mid 90s. I agree and it felt like once again Glenn Martins was understanding the vernacular of a younger of a younger audience like he did very very well at Diesel. I do think his first sort of his first he, I think he's done three collections for Diesel but one of them wasn't very good. So his latest two collections are beautiful. Um because he had like a little like a teething period. I always feel like the first three collections you have to give a designer a chance to settle. Um but like his latest two collections for Diesel were just brilliant. Like I just thought they were so well done and as someone who like would consume that it, it made me interested in diesel again and, and I thought that was excellent so I feel like he has a real talent for tapping into this younger vernacular um, and like we say we do fashion is a business and I think people sometimes forget like there is a fashion economy we need to make sure that we're enticing future generations to feel included enough to want to buy it and I don't just want consumers to feel like they need to buy something as a status symbol like perhaps they have kind of up until now because it was this idea of like exclusivity you're in the club we really want people to just love what they wear because clothing is such a beautiful thing um ryan favorite design favorite piece favorite number hi two favorites i love the hooded like mesh white one because it's just like really encompassing and it also is like a reference to Gautier's archive so i really appreciated 
the like white hooded one. I also did appreciate the denim skirt one a lot for the reason that you just described. I do think it's really compelling to the younger audience. And I think that was very intentional and really smart. I also feel it still is a really great reference to Gautier archives and obviously the Y Project archives and the use of denim. I thought that that was a really intelligent pull. It looks like the 1995, like really futuristic collection. I think it's fall or something like that from Gautier. It is so, the silhouette, the, everything about it is just so intentional without being so literal as a literal reiteration of something from the Gautier archives while being really reminiscent of what he was doing. It's just so smart and so like forward thinking. Yeah, I agree. I definitely agree. I just, I, it was just, it was so well done and it didn't feel too referential to the point that it was exclusive. Like you had to know that, that reference, you could still just enjoy it in isolation. But if you did know that reference, you just felt like you were sort of like unwrapping a Christmas present and that there was another layer to it, which I, not that I celebrate Christmas, obviously, but that, that was gorgeous because I am Jewish. Um, Tuba, Favorite look, there were some looks that when I saw my heart just leaped because I was like, I know my audience will love this and I know they will enjoy it. Are there, are there any looks that you feel like are really enjoyable to communicate to your audience? Yeah, well, that was this one knitwear that dress that was made, what was this knitwear dress with the, the denim inside of it. And I think that's, again, something that I love about Glamart is that he managed to also implement his prior collections and his works uh, with denim into it. And it looks so elegant. And he's very well in doing knitwear as well. I think that's something my project is very famous for. But here he also managed to kind of uh, integrate this um, denim fabric inside this intricate cable design that is like very classical. Mm -hmm. But then like integrate denim in it, is, this is like mind blowing to me and I just love it. Uh, it's, uh, it's a different dress, but um, yeah, that was the one where I was uh, really like, uh, uh, I want to have this one. And it also, again, here, it doesn't seem like it's couture. I mean, that's something I love about it. It is when you look at it in detail, it definitely is, and it will probably have taken a lot of time, but it seems like I can wear it, and that's what makes it approachable, and that's so, so genius of Glenn, and yeah, I love that one. I agree. I think for me personally, I just thought the like tall wrapped dresses, which was like number 23. And then there was also one towards the end that like I see Zendaya in, like when I close my eyes at night, this is what I see, um, which was look 31. Cause it just reminded me of like June, just like sweeping and gorgeous. And I just think she would look incredible in it. Um, and again, I, it's like feeding into the vernacular of where like there were so many looks where I could see celebrities wearing it. I know loads of fashion people lately have been saying that they hate celebrity culture and fashion but for someone who grew up without a lot of access to fashion this was a really crucial sort of thing for me I mean I've literally only just stopped becoming a teenager and like you think about the fact of like I was reading Vogue at like 15 and it was celebrities that made the pieces seem relatable because they were suddenly animated on people who I knew previously and it made that world seem just a little bit closer um in terms of little Easter eggs that were hidden in the collection, we obviously had like the Jean-Paul Gaultier illusion pieces and the corsets. Osama, do you think those are pieces that could then be taken and sold sort of as ready to wear pieces that, that could diffuse down um, and sort of remind people of, of those great Jean-Paul Gaultier um, accents? Um, yeah, absolutely. I think it's, it's very likely because I feel like now the lines between ready to wear and couture at least visually are very blurry so um unless you get really close to even even in a lookbook shot it's very hard to to see the, the the details and the movement and all of these things i definitely think that the staples and everything that i heavily reference as jean paul's work is something that could definitely like i think sell, sell really well and, and and be received really well from a consumer's perspective um and i would be i think surprised to see who that is then a couture client is it would be interested to gravitate towards these pieces and of course like price point and all of these things but yeah very curious yeah. I think I look 14 is just one that I want up on the screen because I think it's gorgeous um I have heard that it's been really popular with Japanese um couture clients that it, it's done really well with Japanese clients and there's also been several mainland uh Chinese sort of like collectors who who uh, have very very large collections um in terms of collecting fashion history who also have pieces belonging to poire and stuff like that they really want to buy a piece that feeds into what they feel like is a really historic collection um and i think 
that is a really important thing. It felt like it wasn't for the conventional couture consumer, which is nice. Like we've been talking about, it feels like it's sort of opening that up. Glenn Martin's now it feels like this has consolidated his almost like one of his final form he has done an accessible brand and made it cool with diesel that's well on its way why project is something that like every fashion tabby wearing person just like basically will rip their clothes off for um and now he's done couture and he's done couture to great critical reception has he solidified his place as one of the fashion greats already tj what do you think I think he's definitely well on the way. I mean, his last collection for uh, Y Project, what was that last week? Um, I I mean, I thought it was sensational. I think that was him 100% at the top of his game, like the silhouettes, illusions, sort of techno rave hues that, you know, felt so superbly optimistic. Um, and, you know, it, it was incredibly futuristic. And I think what, what Glenn does really well is that he is able to keep that, keep that, Finger on the pulse. God, that was terrible. Sorry, not. No, finger. no, we love a cliche. We love a cliche. <laughs> um, but he he is able to understand. I think his Gen Z audience. Uh, you know, and especially the inclusion, like the small snippets of JPG that he included in the collection, which I thought was really smart as well to do that a week before his, you know, the Couture collection. Um, you know, that, that Gen Z audience, they're so obsessed with nostalgia. They're so obsessed with, you know, those like sort of 90s, quintessential like 90s fashion brands, whatever. And you only need to go into Depop these days, you know, see how fascinated they are by by some of JPG's best moments, like the torso and boob prints. Yeah. Um, and yeah, yeah, it, it, sorry, it, just rambling, but it, it did feel superbly Glenn. Like everything yeah. was, you know, maximized, like maximized silhouettes were like mind bending. Um, and I think that the, I, I think this collection, yeah, it, it felt like its greatest greatest evolution yet. Um, and then I think him doing a couture collection, it, you know, it's, it's, it feels like a nice three sixty. Um, I agree, and I think his Y project also felt like it was paying homage to Jean Paul Gaultier as well. Like, look forty seven in his Y project collection, those like um, body prints, which I just know Bella Hadid is like frothing at the mouth to get her hands on because she will body those. Um, she will look incredible. Like, she, anyway, that's a. I just can't wait for that Instagram post because she'll get her hands on it. Um, that was so gorgeous and it felt so Jean-Paul Gaultier and it felt kind of, it was hinting at this idea that he was being retrospective and paying homage to a designer who was just like um, Thierry Mugler, loving fashion. It felt like every single collection, they were enjoying themselves and it felt like their consumer, that it was this like electric kind of contagious energy of just gorgeous, gorgeous stuff with incredible and really interesting meanings behind them as you peeled it back. And I feel like someone like Maria Grazia just doesn't quite have that flair. And often it just feels like quite lifeless clothing, even if it's quite pretty. Um, looking at sort of the Dior Couture Atelier, um, Atelier pictures and the videos that they put out, it's so incredibly well made, but it doesn't have fun to it. It doesn't have a bit of sort of traction behind it. Um, Ryan, for Glenn Martins, do you feel as well like he's 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 really on his way to sort of establishing himself as a great because he has such a way to interact with with a younger generation? I do. I certainly think he's establishing himself on the way to become a great, and I think it comes from his ethos, which I think separates him from a lot of designers. I think him himself. I think. He, Glenn Martins, as well as Gautier, both have a very unique ethos in their cultural context in designing and fashion. And I think that that's what separates them and makes their design so forward thinking and futuristic. It's one thing to know how to design beautiful garments and make clothes, but it's another thing to have the spirit of the customer in mind when you're designing and the spirit of the people who maybe can't even access the designs, but want to access the energy that you're sharing when you're designing these things. And I think Glenn Martin's scaling at Y Project so slowly so mindfully and so thoughtfully regarding like building the brand's accessories and shoe lines and everything like that, like really, really slowly and thoughtfully with the consideration of the, the public is what separates him from a lot of people, especially around his like demographic. And I think that that's gonna continue to give him success and create beautiful designs for like a very long time. 
And no accessories in this show as well. I feel like Daniel Roseberry had some really great fun with his Scaparelli accessories. And I mean, there are some points where I, I've, some critics have said that they feel like the accessories overpower the designs because they come a bit sort of like cliche, like the glasses. Uh, personally, I don't. I think they complement it incredibly. And I think the Scaparelli bijou like is gorgeous and um beautiful do you wish that there had been some accessories to complement this collection because like you said glenn has done really brilliant accessories in the past i mean the ugg boot that he did for rihanna comes to mind straight away i'm happy he didn't do accessories because i do think it would have been i can't imagine it not being very referential of the the past archives and i think it would have taken away from the discernment that was used in this collection that makes it such a standout collection. I was looking for accessories and I had anticipated and had so much. I was like, he's going to do double layered necklaces. He's going to do this and that. And I'm really happy that he didn't. I think that was very thoughtful. Yeah, it felt refined. It felt like it was purposeful. It was very much, these are beautiful clothing that I've spent a lot of time thinking about. And when I think of Jean-Paul Gaultier, I also, I don't think of accessories. I think of, you know, like beautiful dresses and mesh tops and illusion wear. You know, I don't think of like a Chanel flap, for example, when I think of Chanel. Um, Tuba, is this Glenn Martin someone who you think increasingly will see really really exciting things from do you think he will continue a Y project with sort of in increasing accolade and success and where does a designer like that go now do they stay in a brand like Lagerfeld for a long time or do we want to see more of a of a, of a development Actually, I mean, I wish him all the best and that he gets the most recognition possible. I think that's what happened right now. But I actually think also that he will never be as commercial as Karl Lagerfeld was designing or Kim Jones's. I think he's still too niche for these big houses. And I also don't wish to see him there, actually, because that's not something he deserves. I could definitely imagine him at Maison Margiela, for example, maybe to get to a house that is a lot more revolutionary that also has a more philosophical uh, heritage and background to it. That is not only heritage because it comes like from um, aristocrats or something and horses and stuff, uh, but something that has definitely more virtues <laughs> in arts. Yeah, I mean, Chanel is definitely, I mean, it's my favorite topic. Um, yeah, but I want to see him at a house that also does him justice. And there are not many houses actually, especially no big ones. Um, I mean, I think what would also be interesting if Jonathan Anderson would ever leave Loewe, for example, to see him there, maybe because they're also kind of artistic, uh, yeah. especially when it comes to uh, a different house. So I think we will see a lot more of him. Uh, I would love to see him at Magella, as I said, because right now I think there also needs to come a change. Uh, but we will definitely see a lot more of him, and I hope we do. Yeah, I agree. John Galliano, watch your back. Um, I think I, that sort of wild creativity would suit Margiela so well. And actually, the show space was kind of Margiela-esque as well. It didn't feel super, super performancey like someone like Chanel, where poor Virginie Viard has to lean on the crutch of a show space, um, which is a really bad sign when people think more about your show space than they do about your boring tweet designs. Um, it just, with like the drape and the separation and the plain black flooring. Um, and he had his, uh, it was like chiffon curtains um, and flooded with these like kind of electric eerie sounding. It did, it, it felt very Margiela. Um, do you think there's a new generation of kind of Antwerp six out there and that Glenn Martins is someone where the generation below us will similarly revere them as we revered Margiela and Walter Van Buren Donk and designers like that? I don't think that we will have the same strongness of these Antwerp 6 that we had like 20 years ago. I think there will not be a new Rick Owens or new Olivier Thieskens or Andy Malmista. I don't think that we will have it just in that concentration. Of course, it's kind of funny to see that they're all Belgians kind of who get this avant-garde um, and yet this disruptive sense for fashion is maybe comme les garçons also. Uh, so I don't think we will have it in that concentration. But what I'm aware of is that the younger fashion enthusiasts are definitely very different to 10 years ago, to 20 years ago. They're not that much concentrating. And that's like 
I mean, that's a social economic thing. Also, people, younger kids are just so much more uh, aware of diversity, of political issues. And this also co completely changed our sense for fashion. So Chanel and Fendi, I think, are not maybe the uh, most wanted brands anymore for younger kids, but brands, as you said, like the London-based ones, like Alualia or, I don't know, um, any other ones. So I think we will not get that much avant-gardism from the M46 uh, as we used to, but the fashion sense overall just changed a lot. So we don't maybe need the Antwerp 6 anymore. Uh, we just have it already. Like uh, in every country, we get Korean brands. We have a lot of Asian brands. We have African brands, uh, designer names that we never used to hear of. So it's maybe not that required anymore to get this sophisticated avant-garde uh, scene because we already have it kind of. No, I agree. I feel like people aren't really looking for that cult status stamp of approval where the Vogue editor suddenly realizes oh, actually they're quite good. People don't really care about that anymore. They just love having their own niche and community that they participate in. Um, I think we are going through waves of designers. Um, and obviously we had like anti-fashion with, uh, I mean, Kenzo Takada actually came over first and then uh, Ray and Yoji Yamamoto came over in 81. Um, so a really interesting period. And I, I do actually think the next generation of designers who we revere like the Antwerp Six will come out of Africa. I was recently talking to several Nigerian designers who I believe are sort of the next wave of great fashion because Africa is the continent that we have given the least exposure to despite the fact that it has one of the oldest heritages uh, combined with fabric and, and, and um, and sort of fashion communication, but that's a whole other social anthropology conversation. Um, we, as a community, as a fashion community, were amazed by watching Valentino yesterday. People really, really loved it. However, something that Valentino did really well was diverse casting um, in terms of age and body. And Pier Paolo is always incredible in terms of casting a diverse range of people uh, racially. This show, I couldn't help but after I got over the initial, wow, aren't these clothes beautiful? I feel like the casting actually fell a little short in hindsight. Ryan, what, what do you think? It was interesting that the casting had not, as, as far as I can tell, not much age diversity, body diversity, and so many different things that um, Gautier is actually known for. I was really surprised, but I was also contextualizing it as well, because I was thinking about the fact that in this day and age, that doesn't seem so like, outlandish to have like body diversity or racial and ethnic diversity and disability diversity because people kind of see it as a ploy now because they're kind of so exhausted with it socially and culturally because of people using it and employing it as a, a pull you know what I mean so I, I thought about the the social implications of it but I also withdrew because I do realize that sometimes people don't regard it when it's done anymore and see the value in it because of how often it's been used to like do authentic marketing like look at all these older women and look at all these disabled people on the runway when they don't hire people who are disabled. They don't hire people who are older. They don't have any of that representation in their companies and they don't treat the people in their companies to reflect the way that they're casting on the runway regardless. So it's worth considering, but I've also tried to be understanding. Yeah, I understand it. It's important to always contextualize these things and realize that, you know, on the one hand, fashion doesn't operate in a vacuum, but on the other hand, you know, these are extremely considered decisions. I must admit, I was slightly more cynical, and I thought that because it's a couture show, they didn't want to offend an older clientele who could afford it by using a bigger body variety. I've got to be completely honest, like my thought straight away was like, oh, they wouldn't do that. But then I'm like, actually, they probably would because people are paying, you know, hundreds of thousands of pounds for a garment. Osama, do you think that cynicism is founded or is that just youthful naivete um i was kind of disappointed not to see that like things that jean paul gautier was known for like having french pop culture icons into the on the runway random people and also i make that alignment with margella a lot where like it's kind of like fashion by the people for the people and you want to see the people but then there's this like double speech where it's couture so you know, is it intentional? Is it not intentional? Are we talking to the client? Is it not to offend the client? So I felt like there was, there's this whole blurriness to it. I did expect them with a bit more diversity for being straightforward. Um, um, didn't happen. I hope next season, honestly. <laughs> but um, I think uh, it didn't deliver on that. They didn't deliver on that. So yeah, kind of disappointed on that front. 
No, I, I, I agree. And always I'm inclined to be cynical because I've had the displeasure of operating in some fashion circles where you still meet people who have, I mean, I'm going to use the polite term antiquated views um, and it is shocking. And then when you see that performed on a runway at first, sometimes one can think to themselves, oh, you know, like it, it's important because of the client, et cetera, et cetera. But when we look deeper, the people consuming couture in many ways are the ones that rule our society. They're the 0.01%. And if they're not seeing it representative, when they leave their bubble for a single second and come to the real world, the real world during Haute Couture Fashion Week, then maybe that actually speaks to a wider social issue. There's something that fashion needs to address. However, um, is it impossible to address that in couture? Is couture just not the medium? Because by its very nature of definition, it is not inclusive. It's exclusivist. TJ, what do you think? Is it is it impossible to frame couture as inclusive? Yeah, I mean, I think <clears throat> I think it's a tricky one, isn't it? Because on the one hand, the, the basis of couture is elitism. It's uh, exclusivity. It's like you said, it's for the 0.01% of the wealthiest people in the world how how do you know how, how how do i don't have an answer for this but how do we how do we kind of make that inclusive when when, when the people buying it when the, when the tiny tiny percentage of people on this planet that are actually purchasing couture don't want it themselves and i think that's that's kind of it's a very terrifying eerie kind of thought you know um but yeah like you said you know the people who are ruling, ruling our world do they do they want to see more representation do they want to see more diversity i mean Probably not. Yeah, and I think that's kind of a slightly depressing truth. Um, but you know, it 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 is a truth that needs to be addressed in conversations around couture. And what I would love to see is for the haute couture schedule to open itself up a bit more and to have some designers who um, develop to couture standards. But, perhaps don't have the atelier size or don't have the desire to perform to the really strict parameters of haute couture. And it would be nice to have some, I mean, these are terms that be have become so diluted because they're so overused, couture, haute couture, et cetera. But it would be nice to have some designers that show on that schedule that it's opened up to a little bit who aren't strictly haute couture. I mean, uh, Pia Moss is one that comes, comes to mind straight away. Personally, I thought his collection was incredible. Um, and I spoke about it quite a lot on, on, on my TikTok. Um, but there were loads of people and lots of critics weighing in that it wasn't technically an haute couture collection because he didn't show in uh, Paris, despite the fact that it, that, that it was haute couture. And I feel like we are closing doors that don't need to be closed um, and are stopping conversations that don't need to be stopped that should be encouraged. Um, I do. I I'm, I'm slightly conscious of time. Uh, I do want to just have some final thoughts. Anything to do with Glenn Martin's, the collection itself, or the future of fashion and the future of couture? Um, Osama, can we start with you? Um, I think just jumping back to Valentino that you mentioned, um, that the, the body positivity conversation has been open on that couture front for Valentino, but then the strongest looks on the runway were menswear looks where every single male model looked like a stick. So... <laughs> the step was this tiny exactly like I will literally eat my hat if I ever see a model who looks like me or is a little bit chubby or plus sized walk down in a men's couture catwalk I don't think it will happen before we die yeah I think the thing is with body positivity it's very polarizing so the minute one gender gets body positivity the other one becomes a stick so we'll have to wait until a couple next couple of years probably uh with Glenn I think honestly very credibilizing collection very promising future at least in couture i think it's because in ready to wear he's made his mark definitely so i'm i'm very excited to see him progress in couture um as we mentioned earlier i think uh Maison Magella would be obviously like a perfect finality for him and um this whole way and and, and vision he has for the, the the fabric and the garment and this whole his approach on the construction and all of these things and and i would love to see how his um, sensitivity and and um, and eye translates into that, um, but honestly, a beautiful collection. I think it was a. I think it was a great moment to witness. Yeah, I agree with both of those sentiments. It, it was an incredible collection. It was it was 
so well done but there is a wider conversation that you know Glenn is a really good designer who actually has championed good diversity through it through other collections and 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 through other movements um but you know we are entering a wider conversation where couture is sort of like the last upper echelon that we're looking to and kind of saying that does need to mimic a social change that has happened it's time for this to catch up um tuba sort of final thoughts anything that i haven't allowed you to say <laughs> no actually not i i just want to repeat again that i think what i loved about this collection so much and actually i had i wasn't even wa watching out couture shows ever because i was so bored of them and this has been like the first one ever that was interesting as you said in terms of construction but it was a couture show without being couturesque without the huge embellishments without just making gowns because you want to make gowns i mean and, uh, he also said in an interview glenn that he loved to make these gowns because he never has the chance and he had all the possibilities so he did that and he managed to do that in such a good way and in, also in terms of diversity, I mean, we might maybe not see that in terms of models, but definitely in terms of approachability for consumers. And we always say we want old couture to be more accessible. Do we really want that? I'm not sure of that. We want to be exclusive, actually. So there's always this discrepancy that we have to manage. And I think he, he did that very well. He did something that seems like it's approachable but it will probably be not for us but anyway uh, I think it was just beautiful to see and he managed to show everybody designing at a couture house that you can be modern and future forward and still designing couture so I loved it yeah I I agree with that entirely actually I think that very specifically like you I get bored of the Oak Couture collections as much as I'm sure Ellie Saab is a nice bloke I just it, it becomes repetitive but also because this isn't in our consumption dialogue it's not interesting whenever I look at clothing call me consumeristic that I want at least one percentage of it to be able to put on my own body because otherwise I would just go to a gallery and look at art. Like the fun thing about fashion for me is that I can wear it. Um, and I, I, I agree and I understand what you say when you say, do we want couture to be completely democratized? Um, and also just singularly from a, from a price point, when we're paying those artisans a good wage with the amount of hours, and we can be talking about thousands of hours. I mean, I remember Guo Pei had one dress that took 7,200 hours. Um, you know, those can't be priced at an accessible consumer point. So, you know, something has to give. Um, Ryan, closing thoughts? I think the collection is amazing. I think my hope is that the parameters of Haute Couture are expanded to be more inclusive across some axes at least. And also my hope that we spoke about, spoke about earlier is that the ability for younger, less established designers to enter the fashion industry at more established brands and houses, even in experimental contexts would be advanced so that fashion can advance and be fun and not so boring and so terrible for everybody and hopeless for everybody and it can enchant people again the way that this collection has and I hope that that inspires like young people in the future to get into fashion whether that's as a spectator or a creative. Yeah I, I agree with that and I think you know like being a spectator in fashion is now suddenly like exploded like the audiences that we can have you know via an app like TikTok but also via, via something like YouTube like the idea that as an audience, I have nearly 16 million people a month watching me. It's like crazy. You're like, oh my God, this many people want to know and learn about fashion. All of a sudden it's like an explosion. And then, you know, we do have to think about how is this translating to be relatable to them? And like you say, I do, I do think this succeeded in that. I do think it felt like, yes, it had that duality of can oak chair, but be accessible, but it still felt like it was digestible in some capacity. Um, TJ, what do you think? Yeah, uh, loved the collection. I thought it was great. Um, in terms of couture as a whole, I mean, I've never really paid attention to couture. I don't really care for it, really. Except for, <laughs> sorry. Except for those... Really At the end of the panel, you say that. <laughs> oh, except for the magical moments, you know, like then there's Balenciaga or this, for example. This excites me. It's beautiful. It's theatrical. It's great. Um, but I think in order for couture to keep up with such an ever-changing ever-changing audience um they're gonna have to make some some serious changes and if they do if they are gonna make changes will it even have that much of an impact yeah 
yeah and you know is this the wrong sort of hill to die on are there more important and more impactful things that will actually change the next generation you know the couture client is so stuck in their way you know they don't care they're you know living in their mansions and watching the little people so yeah yeah i agree and there's an argument there that the couture client will never be a sort of a progressive client because to participate in that like uber capitalism i mean you cannot have an ethical billionaire um then you know will they ever care because of the price point is is that just like a moot point you know are we going to just walk in circles totally totally and i think you know but like that for example that's why the face doesn't really cover couture shows it's because it's just not really in line with our audience and what they want like i know said, i pitched it your tiktok once and alexa was like nope <laughs> <laughs> but, um what was i saying what was i saying yeah but it's very similar to what you were saying about you know what, what excites me the most about fashion obviously is seeing you know getting excited about things i could wear or hope to wear or whatever couture just doesn't do that for me you know uh and I, and I don't really think it does for our audience either. But, you know, but these these kind of moments, you know, they're quite spellbinding, quite beautiful. That's nice. Look at those pictures. <laughs> That's nice. Yeah, no, I agree. It's one of those moments where you can watch a fashion show and just allow yourself to kind of have that slightly childish feeling of just, I love this. I think it's beautiful. Just allow yourself to be a little bit enchanted to sort of suspend your disbeliefs for 20 minutes and just enjoy the spectacle. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Um, I thought the show, me, um, I thought the show was gorgeous. I loved it. I think Glenn Martins is an incredible designer. I am most excited actually to see what he does at Diesel, just because I think his Y project is so just like bona fide brilliant that it's one of those like consistent great hitters for me. And I love everything they do. This was a gorgeous little kind of like capsule of what he can do with couture and what he can do with really refined women's wear um I would have actually liked to have seen him done one menswear couture look because I think that would have been interesting Valentino really stepped up their game with menswear couture this season and I would have been nice to have seen sort of um Glenn Martin's vision um but this was just overall really really brilliant and, and um I thought it was wonderful um so thank you to all of you guys for indulging me in a little chit chat about couture um thank you to all of our panelists and virtual audience for watching for more extensive fashion week coverage be sure to visit showstudio.com and if you're watching via show studios youtube be sure to like comment and subscribe below and we will see you next time thank you